Alrighty. Okay, well, welcome to our uh, seminar on how to increase sales. Woo, isn't that exciting? How to increase sales. This is the seminar that everyone's been waiting for. Finally, everyone's going to learn how to sell houses now. Isn't that exciting? Absolutely. Woo, well, guess what? I can't show you how to sell houses. You know why? Because houses sell houses. Real estate agents do not. Real estate agents, in some cases, screw up deals. <laughs> what we're going to teach you to do is how to screw up fewer. And if you screw up fewer, you'll close what? More. more and you'll yeah. have more money and you'll have more success in this real estate business. Okay? Fun. So the bottom line is, here, here's the good news. The good news is I'm going to uh, be able to help you sell um, more homes in less time by showing fewer. Does that make sense? Yes. By showing fewer, you can sell more homes in less time, right? Yeah. So, uh, the bad news is I can not I can never teach you how to sell a house because houses sell houses. People do not sell houses. I hope you internalize that dialogue because you may want to use this a hundred times uh, a week as you're talking to sellers and even buyers for that matter. Okay? It makes a big difference. Now, People um, don't sell houses, houses sell houses. Sell houses. Exactly. Yes. Yep. I don't sell houses. House, the house sells itself. You know, um, it's interesting. Sellers will often say to you, well, listen, I need you to sell my house. And you say, okay, I'm trying. See, when you say that, you're automatically putting all the responsibility on you. But if you tell them, look, it, I don't sell houses. Your house has to sell itself. Have you had it staged? Did you get rid of the clutter in the garage like I told you? Did you price it right? Last time I had an open house, you, you didn't uh, clean up like I had suggested, right? Houses sell houses. So you have to put that responsibility and sometimes that blame off of you and onto someone else. Not someone else, but something else. And what is that? The house. And who has control about, of the house most of the time? The who? The seller. The seller, absolutely. Okay. So, today I'm, gonna, I'm going to share with you today, there are three parts that I'm going to condense into one session. So I'm going to set, uh, include session one, two, and three on how to increase sales all in one session. There are magic in what? Three. Three. Magic in three. Experience. In each segment, there are going to be three keys within the three sections, okay? So again, gang, there's magic in what? Threes. Threes, you got it. Now, I, I believe that there's magic in threes so much that I made a short list before the seminar today uh, of just to prove to you that there are magic in threes. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to challenge you to add to this list, and I'm gonna actually write it down. If you, if you can come up with something that I can add to this list, I will, of course, do that. Um, okay, you ready? There are three coins in a fountain. fountain. Three blind mice. Three musketeers. Three wise men. men. Women. Three little. <laughs> well, no, you didn't understand that. There's only three wise men in the world. The rest of the wise people. There you go. That's right. <laughs> None of which are standing in front of you, but that's okay. Uh, that was quick. Well, you know, that's Good. reaction. Dialogue. You gotta be. It's being in real estate this long. You just Whoa. have to be quick. <laughs> no, that's good. And you have to know your place, too, right? Three little okay. pigs, right? Three holes in a pair of pants. I came up with that one on my own. Think about it. You just the top and the two bottoms, right? Okay, yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. Three holes in a pair of pants. Yeah. The top and the two legs. There are three. Uh, <laughs> he's getting deep. Sorry. Getting deep. <laughs> I'm stretching. Yeah. Am I stretching? Yeah. 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 If I'm stretching, then that would be spandex. I didn't say spandex. Uh, oh, but oh. Uh, three lights on a traffic light. There are three sides to a triangle. Three points on a triangle. There are three beats in a waltz. Goldilocks and the what? Three bears. Three bears. Da -na -na -da -na -na. My three sons. Right. <laughs> you younger people are like, what? You might not have watched it though. Yeah. Um, threes 
company. 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 Yeah. Whoa, all right, very good. Mm -hmm. Uh, three is a crowd. Two's company. Crowd, right? Two's right. company. Three is a crowd. Well, that was the very next one of my uh, incredibly I'm long your list now. This is, of three. This is scary. It's getting too long. Third time's a charm. charm. Phony is a three dollar bill. Yeah. If it has three leaves and three points, it's poison ivy. Poison ivy. Very good. I <laughs> <laughs> there are three hands on a clock. Uh -huh. When you when you talk about automobiles, there are usually a three year, thirty six thousand mile oh, warranty. <laughs> the big three. Three strikes and you're out. out, right? The big three. There are three out. outs. There are three outs and a half an inning. Three thirds make one hole. Three goals make a hat trick. There are three woods and a golf bag. Kenny Rogers, you're once, twice, three, three times on the right? <laughs> How about this three way calling? Music, again, three dog night. Food, three bean salad. <laughs> three part harmony. Three felonies equals life in prison. There are three moons for the planet Jupiter. How about this? Barnum and Bailey's three ring circus. Wow, you guys are good, right? Three ring binder, three hole punch. Remember, folks, professionals close at least three times. Okay? So, are there any other magics in threes? Are there any other things you can think of in three? So if a three Holy Trinity. Holy Trinity. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, email them to me. I'll let you know. And, uh, All right. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to talk about how to increase sales. Angela. And again, gang, there's magic in threes. You got it. You know, I brought up something last week or the week before. I don't remember which one it was. But I talked about um, closing at least how many times? Three. At least three times because there's magic in threes. When you close three times, it's not closing too much to the point where you're a pain in the neck. But if you close once or twice, do you know that this, the top 1% of all successful salespeople close more than once? And the top half percent close more than twice to get the order. And that's true in any sales business, not just real estate. You follow me? So always close a minimum of three times. And I, I made that big long list of all the threes just to kind of help you internalize that a little more. There's magic in threes. Okay, how to increase sales. Number five on the top countdown, on the top five questions. This is part one of three parts. The key to staying in control when working with the buyers when working with buyers is A, show them everything they want to see. B, there is no way to stay in control with buyers. And some of you are smiling about that one. Or C, take things one step at a time and stay on track. You got it. C, stay on track. Number four, the first step to effectively work with buyers is A, qualify them on the phone. B, get them into the office. Or C, make them at, uh, meet them at the house they called about. B. A. How many were here last week? Get them in. What's, what's your goal? Get them into the office, right? Uh, number three, at an initial meeting with the buyers, right? At the initial meeting with the buyers, show them how to work one step at a time. B, cover your agency disclosures. C, ask for their loyalty. Or D, all of the above. D. Oh, Good today, you're on fire. <laughs> it's right there. Right. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> the key to selling more houses with fewer showings is to A, narrow down the selection to just a few houses, or B, widen the selection to increase your options. A. A. That is incorrect. Oh. The answer is B, yeah. and I will show you why in just a few moments. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I always throw, I always throw a hook in there. I know, I know. Trust me, I'll back it up. Don't worry, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. <laughs> Number one, they almost never buy. Listen, I'm here to shock you, right? Am I doing a good job so far? Right? <laughs> they almost never buy, A, the first house that you show them, B, 
what they tell you they're looking for or see until you become their friend. Bees. The bees have it. That's correct. It's bees. What they tell you they're looking for. They never find what they tell you they're looking for. No, they say colonial, and then they say, that's not a ranch over there. And they want to get on a bicycle. Sometimes they don't know what they want. That's true, yes. They don't know what they want. They want to be we talked about that last week. We had fun last week, too, didn't we? Yeah. Good, yeah. good session. Okay. Um, hey, again, how many rules do you have on your page there, the next page? Three. Three? That's a shock. I can't believe it. Is it really three? Okay, good. Um, you know, we talked about this before. We talked about work with people one step at a time and stay on track. Right, gang? Remember that? Okay. <laughs> so, remember this? Let's, let's say this is the track, right? What do you think that stands for in the buying process? Write this down if you want. Closing. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Um, do this. Um, write this down for number one. Work with people one step at a time or not at all. Work with people one step at a time or not at all. Work with people one step at a time or not at all. Uh, this is this is intense. <clears throat> Here's what this stands for. In the buying process, remember we talked about the listing process, right? Well, now we're talking about the buying process. The buying process is you build rapport, you qualify, and you show them homes, and then you close. Qualify, sorry. Oh, it is a cue. Well, it was a C before. It was, <laughs> it was after qualify? Show them, show them homes, and then close. Make it sound easy. Okay, so everyone repeat this after me. What is? Qualify. Show homes. Close. One more time. You ready? Qualify. Show homes. Close. Right? So that's the process. That's the way you walk through it, right? So it's one, two, three, four. Stay on track or don't work with them at all. Some people say to me, uh, John, uh, I've already shown them, you know, uh, 10, 20 homes. I can't get control of these people now. Here's what I have to, have to, here's what I have to tell you. It's probably too late. <laughs> it's probably too late. You probably have lost them. You've lost control. Um, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do to help you on that one. Because if you don't take control in the beginning and you lose it, well, it's really hard to teach an old dog what? Two tricks. Two tricks. Three tricks. You, have a lot of, you may have some old buyers, and it might be hard to teach them some new tricks. So, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but let me share this with you. From here on out, when you work with a buyer, you build rapport, you qualify, you show and sell, and you close, right? So now, it's true that all of you, you build rapport, you show and sell homes, you qualify, and then you close, right? No. No. I reversed it, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure, you're saying that now. But here's what happens in reality. You get a phone call. Ring, ring. Hi, I want to see that house. And what does the agent do? They immediately go out and three them. <laughs> right? They three that buyer right away. They go out and show them a house right away. Right? Sure, you say that now in class. But what happens really out there in the field? What are most agents doing? What are you doing? Be honest. Yep. Right? You build rapport with them on the phone, they want to see the house, you run out and go and show them the property. And you skip this step. Out of control. How to be more in control? Stay on track, <coughs> work with them one step at a time, or not at all. In other words, if they don't want to follow this process, don't work with them at all. And I'll say what I said last week, because I know what you're thinking, but John, I might lose some, and I say, what do I say? Let yeah, let him go. go. You're going to lose the same amount of buyers that you're losing now 
Only, less, quicker. Only this way you lose them quicker, right? <laughs> Remember, gang? Remember we talked about that? <laughs> okay. So, we build rapport, you qualify, show them homes, and then you close. Now, rule number two is safe island to every buyer. And safe island at the start. Safe island, of course, is telling them what you're going to do before you do it. And the dialogue that I put there that I so um, uh, nicely actually wrote out for you so you didn't have to uh, get any cramps with your writing today is I wrote this out. If I, sh if Mr. and Mrs. Meyer, <coughs> if I have to show you any more than three or four homes, then I'm probably not doing my job properly. Uh, and I don't, and, and I'm taking a chance of wasting whose time? Your time. Your time. <laughs> exactly, your time. So to help you find the right home in the right, at the right price in the shortest amount of time, We've created a process. It's very similar to what I taught you with the listing. Remember the listing? I said, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, uh, you know, let me show you how I work. Uh, I don't want to take a listing just for the sake of taking the listing because that would only uh, frustrate you and waste your time and cause you to make less money on the sale of your property. So what I want to do is I don't want to just list your home. I want to sell it. So in order to get your home sold, we've created a process. Can I share it with you now? So the same thing is true with a buyer. And um, so what I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you and just read that dialogue uh, real quick. And actually, uh, you can, and, uh, both people read it to each other at the same time. So it's going to be sound very confusing. But I'd just like you all to read it. In fact, you know what? Hold on one second. I got a, I got a, I got a different idea. I think it'll be a little better. Why don't we read it all together real quick and, and let me take the lead and just kind of read it out loud along with me. Because there's something, you know, about a workshop it's different than a lecture or a seminar. If you actually, you know, hear something, you'll retain it. But if you hear it and do it, you'll retain it even more. Okay? So, uh, let's start with the dialogue. Ready? Go. If I show you more than three to five homes, I'm not doing my job properly, and I'm taking a chance of wasting your time. So to help you find the right home at the right price in the shortest amount of time, we have created a process. Okay, great. And I hope those of you that are watching this DVD and, and those of you that are watching the DVD in the other room right now, I hope you're all following along, right? Hello? Okay, good. <laughs> all right, so now we've created this, uh, this process. How many steps in the process? Four. Ah, oh, shouldn't there be three? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what a bummer. Just ruined everything now that there's, there are four. We have the number four <coughs> peeking its head around the corner. But number one. Ask seven questions. I know they're not three. I wish there were three questions, but there have to be seven. <laughs> ask seven questions. Number two. I'm just going to ask you to write these down, and then I'm going to I'll go through the four and explain them. Uh, number two, what I'd like you to write down: look at all homes in MLS. Look at all homes in MLS. Some of you are thinking, John, gas is creeping up to four bucks a gallon. <laughs> I have to show all the homes in MLS. Oh, look at them on the computer. Oh, very good. Okay, this now you're on track. And then in parentheses, put down narrow to three to five. Narrow <laughs> to three to five. So the dialogue would kind of go like this, Mr. and Mrs. Byer. What I'm part of the pro four-step process is number one, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Number two, we're going to look at all the homes in the most <coughs> listing service, well, not physically, but we're actually going to. Uh, sort through them on the computer system that we have right here in my office in the multiple listing service. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all the homes in the multiple listing service and we're going to narrow it down to the best three to five homes that match your criteria. Okay? Um, then we're going to go back to the office and go over the details. So write that down please. Uh, number three is go back to the office and go over the details. I thought we were already at the office. No, that's um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Show We've narrowed them down to three to five. I left out the part. We're going to go see those three to five. Homes. Okay, you did leave that. Yes, out. I did leave that. I apologize. Okay, that's number so, two. Yeah. Yeah, the extension of number two is look at all the homes in MLS. Narrow down to three to five. See those three to five homes, and then we're going to come back to the office to go over the details. Number four, gang, you ready for number four? Real yeah. simple, I'm going to handle the sale from beginning to end. I'm going to handle the sale from beginning to end.
okay, by a show of you saying, oh yeah, who's ready for number three? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, number three is, widen the search, do not narrow it. Widen the search, do not narrow it. Oh, they love that. <laughs> but John, you just said pick three to five. What do you mean? Here's what, I'll, here's what I mean. You ready for this, gang? Watch. Mm -hmm. This is a buyer. You ask them what it is that they're looking for in a home. And they say, John, I want a four-bedroom house. And you have <coughs> all these homes to look at that are four-bedroom homes that come up in the MLS search criteria. And then they say, but we want brick. Okay, so we have fewer homes to look at. We want white brick. Oh, okay, no problem. We want a corner fireplace. Oh, okay. We want two and a half baths. Oh, okay. We want a three-car garage. Oh, okay. We want a corner, uh, we want a, a, a built-in pool. Oh, no problem. We want air conditioning. Oh, okay, that's, all right, we'll, we'll put that in there as well. Um, we want oil heat, okay. Ooh, gang, gang, <laughs> gang, listen, listen. Where does this house exist? That's in their mind. mind. <laughs> yeah. Nowhere, right? So they give you all this criteria, they give you all these things you're, that they're looking for in their perfect dream home, and what you have to do is you have to take away some of these layers to widen the search to get the three to five homes, right? Mm -hmm. Now, most of the time, not most of the time, maybe half the time, you have buyers that say, well, I want to look in 17 different towns. And then, of course, you need to narrow the search. But sometimes they get, when you start getting into the conversation with them of what they're looking for exactly, you're faced with having to narrow the search down. Who's going to spend their life looking for this home for the buyers? Yeah, not you, right? <laughs> the low producing agent spends their time looking for this home. In fact, something we talked a little bit about last week, and I'll bring it up again, is that the low producing agent builds rapport, qualifies, and then what they do is they select homes for the buyer, and then they go out and show those homes to the buyer. So what happens is they go out and they'll show three to five homes, and because it didn't meet the criteria properly, because they didn't properly qualify them, they'll go out and, sh and select three to five mo more homes, and then three to five more homes. Um, and so it just keeps, the, the number of homes you're showing keeps growing and growing and growing. And I love that dialogue, gang. You know, if I have to show you any more than three or four homes, I'm probably not doing my job right. See, you're setting the expectation. You're telling them what's normal. And when you tell them up front what's normal, they expect it. You see, because if you don't tell them that that's normal, their friends are going to say this, oh, I worked with my realtor. She was the best realtor anyone could ever ask for. Oh, really, why is that? She showed us 52 homes before we bought one. Great realtor. And she's away in Hawaii vacationing. No, she's, she's exhausted. Not. No, <laughs> she's not. She's actually at Walmart handing out little smiley faces. <laughs> <laughs> she went, and fries with hamburgers. Yeah, she's, she has a job now that includes any fries with that. Right. Uh, because she failed out of the real estate business because she didn't make enough money per hour. And, and that's the sad part about it, is that it just spent too much time, and you get so burnt out that there's no profitability at the end. Okay, gang? And you're not helping the buyers. That agent, I would argue, not even argue, I, I would absolutely, I'm convinced, so I won't even argue it, I'll just say it right out as a fact, wasted the buyer's time. Didn't do the buyer any service, didn't help the buyer in any way whatsoever. Wasted the buyer's time, okay? So, next page. Now, without turning back to the other page, I think this is so unfair, and you can if you want to, but <clears throat> let's go through the three rules we just went through as a quick recap. Number one is work with people one step at a time or not at all. One step at a time or what? Not or not at all, right. Number two, what should you do with every buyer? Qualified. No, this. Oh, bring it to the safe buyer. Safe out every buyer. Yeah. In the dialogue, if I show you any more than three to five homes, I'm probably not doing my job, probably I'm taking a chance of wasting your time. So to help you out to find the right home at the right price in the shortest amount of time, we've created a process, right? That's the dialogue. And then you explain to them the four-step process and you, you use the, uh, the, 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 uh, the safe island dialogue that I gave you, right? 
four step process is you ask how many questions? Seven. Seven. Uh, you look at all the homes in the multiple listing service and you narrow it down to how many? And then what do you do? You go out and do it. You go out and three them, right? Yeah. Right? You show them. And then you go where? Back to the office. Back to the office to do what? What does that mean to you and I? Go over the details. Hey, Andre, like? got it. All right. That, to you and I, that means writing an offer. Ah. But to them, we're just going to use the terms, go over the details. You see, too many agents are using the wrong words. They might follow the right track, but they're saying things horrible, like, we're going to go back to my office, and we're going to sit down in a room, and I'm going to close the door. And I'm not going to offer you anything to drink so that you're heavily dehydrated and a little disoriented. And then after that, I'm going to pull out contracts with a lot of legal writing on them and say that say in big letters you must see your attorney before you sign and then I'm gonna ask you to sign these things all these horrible words okay we're just gonna go over the details right don't make a big deal out of it we're just going to go over the details number three uh, the, the third rule is what? What do we do with the search, Ken? Widen it. Widen it. Don't what? Don't, Don't narrow it. Yeah, because here's what happens. that When you narrow down the search with them, that house doesn't exist. And who spends the rest of their life trying to look for that house? You do. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, here's what I hear agents saying. Well, I'll put your criteria, you know, your white brick, north of, south of, east of, corner fireplace, uh, air conditioning, right? All that information. And I'm going to put it in the computer system, and when that right house pops up, it's going to be emailed to you immediately, and then you're going to call me and make an appointment to go see it, and I'm going to show it to you, and you're going to buy it. Does that work? No. no. <laughs> it hasn't worked yet, everybody tells me. Uh, I've tried that. It hasn't worked yet, right? Work with them one step at a time, or don't work with them at all. So too many of you are giving buyers an option. Um, uh, just a second. Too many people are giving the buyers an option. You're saying, well, I can put you on my computer multiple listing service uh, retrieval system and you can get all these listings, or you can come into the office. See, you're not working with, you're not staying on track. You're not working with them one step at a time. You're giving them options that they don't need. You're giving them options that actually are a huge disservice to them. I, I know it's happened at least once, but I mean, very rarely does anyone buy a house without actually looking at it, right? for the majority, unless it's an investor who's out of state and it's a slam dunk, right? But the majority of people that are working with you, that you're coming in contact with, that are inquiring to you about a property, um, you can't give them the option. Because what you're doing is you're doing this. You're giving them an option to fail. And as normal human beings, when human beings are given an option to fail, they, they often do. Okay? When you take away that option to fail, they often what? Succeed. And a buyer, to succeed as a buyer, has to do what? Buy, Buy a house. Buy you got it, right? <laughs> so if you want to be responsible for more successful buyers, stay on track, work with them what? One step at a time or not at all. You got it. Yes, Art? Right. So when we go back and go over the details and make an offer, great. But if we don't, that's then we widen our search. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our author brings up a good point. What if you look at the three to five homes, is what I think you're saying to me, yeah. and what if they hate all three to five of them, right? Well, what do we have to do? We have to widen our search again, don't yeah. we? Uh -huh. Well, maybe we need to increase the price uh, that we're looking in. Maybe we need to change the town if you're not willing to uh, go without certain amenities. And then you have to go back out and start the process over again. The good news is at least you have a process to follow. But prior to today, uh, you might not have had that, but you might have just, you know, not narrowed it down and go to three to five. Given that safe island buyer dialogue is so huge, because what happens is after they don't buy three to five homes, here's what the buyer says to the agent. How would you love to hear this, Sean? We're really sorry. We didn't we didn't like any of those three to five homes. We're just, I guess we're not normal, you know. <laughs> Because Sean explained to them what was normal. It's normal. I mean, we picked out the best three to five homes. If they say to Sean, look, we like house number four, but uh, I think we want to keep looking. And Sean has to look them right in the eye and say, well, respectfully, I have to tell you that if we look at any more homes other than these three to five homes that we saw, 
they're only going to go beyond uh, and not be in the criteria of what you're looking for. Are you saying you, you want to change your criteria? Or is it that you're just not, you're not comfortable yet with the process? And are you, are, you, are you a little bit afraid? Be honest with me. Are you a little bit nervous? Are you a little nervous? That's normal. Be honest with me. Are you a little nervous? Yeah. And if they say, they finally will admit, yeah, we're a little nervous. We like house number four, but we just want to make sure it's the right house. Well, we did make sure it's the right house because we've seen every house on the market. Not physically, but through the process of elimination. And so, would it help you if we just go back and, and go over the details and, and after you <coughs> now feel this? We'll go back to the office, go over all the details, and we'll see how you feel after that. Right? I'm going to give you some more techniques to, to keep going, but I don't want to jump ahead. This is, this is getting good. Now, uh, seven magic questions to never show more than how many homes, Gay? Let me hear it. Five. Five. Yes. Can I ask a quick question? Because sure. We went through these four steps over there. Yes. When, when would you actually, when you meet with them in the office the first time, uh, you got to show them the uh, mandatory uh, yes. and you got to go through the paper. You don't want to go to the houses and show the houses without having contract with them. Absolutely. Would you address it right, right in the first meeting, yeah. everything? Absolutely. For instance, in the first meeting, and that's going to be another seminar, and what I'd like to do is actually present to you a live um, buyer presentation that I would give a buyer. And I'd be the agent, and you folks can be the buyers, and I'll show you exactly what I say and do to go through the process. Today what I'm going to do is actually just explain the process to you. And that if you just follow this process alone, without even knowing the intri intricacies of the actual presentation, uh, you'll be ten times further ahead than, you, than the process that you're potentially using right now. Um, so what you do is, to answer your question, you build rapport first. And as you're building rapport, you uh, first, when you first meet with them, actually, before you even start building rapport, and this is a great rapport building tool, in my opinion, is you actually have the agency disclosure form. And so what I love to say to buyers, and you've heard me say this to sellers, too, is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, uh, he, before, I, before we get into anything, before we talk about anything, Massachusetts state law requires me to show you this form and go over it with you. Uh, I know that you've looked at other homes before and you've met with other agents, so I'm assuming you're incredibly familiar with this form and you understand it, am I right? And they always look at you and say what? No. No. And then you look at them and you look at them and you make what kind of face? Oh. Oh. Really? <laughs> you've never seen this before. How shocking, right? Well, if you read it right here and I read it to them on the first line, it's required that upon first contact that the agent do go over this form with you. So what have you now done to your reputation and the rapport that you have with them? What have you done for yourself? Yeah. 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 You've lended credibility to what you do, you've shown them that you're a professional, right? All of the above. And immediately they now perceive you as someone different, someone better, right? And I think that's the best way to build rapport is to start off with a business relationship being honest. And what you've done by being honest and doing your job, basically just doing the things you're supposed to do. I remember my first manager, George Meservi, said to me, John, if you just do the things you're supposed to do in this business, you'll absolutely shine. I didn't know what he meant at first, but as I continued to work in the business and I saw what other agents are doing, and I saw the results of showing up on time for appointments and going over the agency disclosure when other agents weren't doing it, and I, and I got the feedback from my buyers and sellers, I thought, wow, I get it now. This makes the difference. Right? So, uh, number one, how soon do you need to be settled in your new home? Question number one of the seven questions, are in, which is part of your Safe Island Buyer Dialogue. And by the way, gang, where is step what number two? Qualifying, right? We're qualifying them up. How soon do you need to be settled in your new home? Number two, how long have you been looking for a home? And some people may say, oh, seven years. <laughs> and some of you immediately, instinctively go, oh, brother, get rid of them, right? <laughs> no, the bottom line is you need to probe and maybe ask a few more questions and say, oh, really, why is, why is it that it took you that long? Oh, we were waiting for an inheritance to come through. It went through probate. It took that long to happen. And now we have the funds and we're ready to go now. Oh, <laughs> well, the average agent says, oh, forget this. You know, walks away from the table right then and there. Right? I remember I went to a car dealership one time and I was looking at an automobile and the car dealership, uh, a salesperson came out to me in the lot and I was looking at a vehicle and I wanted to know the difference between uh, one vehicle and the other. There were different models and I didn't know the difference between the two. 
uh, actually three different models. I didn't know the difference between the three. And he said, why don't we come back inside and go over the details? So I said, okay. So I followed him in, and, and uh, I sat down at the, the, the office table with him, and he said, uh, he said, so let me ask you a question. If, uh, are you ready to buy a car today? And I said, well, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe. I said, I don't know. I mean, I just really wanted to get some information. It's possible. He looked at me and says, I, do you want to buy a car today? And I said, um, probably not. And he looked at me, he crumpled up the paper he was writing on, threw it in the basket, and walked outside and had a cigarette. And I thought to myself, well, that's a different way of handling it. <laughs> True story. I, I would never go back to that dealership ever again. Um, but just, it was actually kind of shocking. And uh, the only thing I can think of is that this person had been in the business long enough to feel the pain of what it's like to deal with people who are getting all this information from you and then they never buy. Oh, they buy and somewhere so, else. Or they buy somewhere else. And he was just he just knew in his heart the frustration that was about to come. That he was going to be the educator, not the person making the sale, and he just didn't want to have anything to do with it. So not only I mean, I'm sure there could have been a dialogue that he could have used, right? That would have helped him out of that situation. <laughs> that would have helped he should have continued on to ask more questions. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Because I bet you would have bought a car from them. I probably would. I mean, I could have. Yeah. You know, I could have. But now I never will. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, there are better ways of handling things. In other words, some people that now are doing the right things, but only to a point. They're not following through all the way. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> So, uh, number three. That's why Sean's here. Uh, I know. He was yeah. that guy, right? No, no, no. <laughs> I recruited that guy into real estate, right? <laughs> number three, okay. have you seen any homes that you've liked? Have you seen any homes that you've liked? Number three. I love this question, number four. And, you know, just like the seller qualify qualifying questions, they get gutsier as they go, okay? Number four is, if I found the right home for you in two to three days, would you buy it now? No, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do? If I found the right home for you in two to three days, what would you do? Well, we'd call our Uncle Jack. Jack would come in. Jack's been, you know, a home inspector for, yeah, for right. 13 years. <laughs> but I come and look at it. I and can. here's, here's what I would say. That happened to me. No problem. No problem. No problem. I would say, no problem. Um, here's what we're going to do. When I schedule to view the three to five homes, it's imperative that Jack come with us to look at all three to five homes. Or if they say, I want my parents to come with me to look at the, the home that we find that we like the best. And I always say, no, 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 no. And I always tell them why. I tell them the truth, and I'm going to share it with you. Would you like to hear the dialogue that I use? Sure. Yes. Yep. You're all groaning and mumbling and grumbling right now because you know that the home inspector and or the parents are the kiss of what? Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> you know that when they come in, they're going to knock it down. We paid $36,000 for our house when we bought our property, you know, years ago, and... and uh, you know, what they don't know is their, their kids just paid that much for their car, right? <laughs> and so, um, and they're not so naive. They, they know what, what prices are in most cases. But what they do is, here's what happens. Uh, the couple can only afford a certain amount of property, right? So what they do is, you narrow down the search for them, or you widen the search, right? <laughs> and you find the three to five homes. You go out and look at the three to five homes. They pick the one they like the best. They invite their parents to come and see that property. Their parents chop it all up and they say, oh, that's horrible, the roof is old and the, the, the furnace is old and, and you know, it's uh, these hardwood floors, I don't think there's anything you could do to sand them deep enough to get them to come back to that rich luster like a brand new floor is. What the parents don't realize is that they can't afford new con the new construction home, right? What the, and, and the parents say, this house is a piece of what? Junk, right? What, but what they don't, what the parents don't realize is that in their price range, it's the best piece of junk that they can afford, right? <laughs> right? So, by, you see, what happens is you're putting the buyers through the process of elimination, but if they're not the ultimate decision maker, you're going to lose. 
Work with them one step at a time or not at all. That's, that's a little step I added in there for you. Uh, if there's a little wrench in the works and the parent or someone else or Uncle Jack has to come in and approve it, they need to see all three to five homes or don't show them homes. You're wasting your t their time, you're wasting your time. And I tell buyers that, and I tell them right out. I said, here's the reason why I need your parents to come with us. You need to do everything you possibly can to get your father to come with us to look at these homes. Otherwise, you are going to be disappointed. See, if you take something away from them, they're more apt to comply with it, they're more apt to do it. I don't think of it from my selfish reasons why I am going to potentially lose a sale as a result of it. I'm telling them the truth. The truth is they're going to lose the house of their dreams. They're not going to have the support of their parents. And by the way, dad was kicking in ten grand to help with the down payment, but so he's controlling whether or not they're buying that house. Right? He's just going to say, no, no, no. He, guess what he's going to say? Keep what? Looking. Looking. Keep looking. Looking at what? We've already looked at everything in the multiple listing service. Try explaining that to dad the day of the showing. No. <laughs> Why? You haven't had a chance to build rapport with dad. You haven't qualified him. Right? And because you missed those two steps, imagine working with a buyer missing those two steps. How hard it would be. Right? Almost impossible. So I explained, I said, just to eliminate your potential disappointment, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you have to bring that person so that it's not fair to you or to them to have them look at one home without a comparison to other properties. So uh, providing your dad can come with us, um, I'll schedule these homes for Sunday. If not, we'll have to schedule another. By the way, I did call on this one property. I overheard someone talking to my office. This one's getting a lot of activity. We should, really should get into this one right away. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because that happens all the time. All the time. Yep. The one they like the best on the computer, by the time they get around to showing it, to seeing it, it's already under agreement. Okay. What number are we on now, gang? Five. 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 Number five. I'm going to suggest that our in-house loan officer, Jackie McNinch, call you, uh, so that you can have uh, an, uh, an approval. Yeah, I'm sorry, I worded that wrong. I'm going to suggest that Jackie McNinch from GMAC Mortgage call you uh, so that uh, you can have an approval letter. Where do you spell the last name? M C, capital N I N C H. Okay. And see, this is a crucial point, gang. And, and this is where a lot of real estate agents fail, okay? And those of you watching me on the monitor right now, please listen to this. It's so important. <laughs> Okay? Here's what the average low producing agent says. Here are three mortgage people that you can call and you can get a pre approval um, if you want. And then, you know, I'll need that before, uh, you know, I put in the offer. Now, part of qualifying, gang, is not just motivation, but it's also what? Monetarily. Are they qualified? I need, the, I need you to go through the steps so that we can know accurately what you can afford. Oh, we know what we can afford. We know what our budget is. We know what we want. We went online and we did one of those mortgage calculators and we, you know, we did this and we did that and we ordered our credit report from TransUnion and I'm like, whoa, whoa, okay, well, wait a minute. Um, there are some certain things, there are a lot of little nuances about mortgages that even I don't even know, and I've been in the business for so long, so it's really important that you talk to a mortgage professional. This is a great motivator also to get buyers to, um, to get pre-approved. Share with them this fact, and this isn't in your notes, this is a little bonus I'm going to give you, okay? The fact is that there are millions, and I mean millions, of Americans who have mistakes on their credit report and they don't even know it. Right, Sean, when, when you were pulling up credit reports to show people, or in fi when you were helping people with financing, you'd see that they would have credit reports and they have mistakes on it. Whoa, that, that, that's not me, right? How many of you have ever seen a mistake on your credit report by a show of hands? Have you ever seen one? Almost half the room, you know. I've had on my, they had a different name on mine, they have all different <laughs> wacky things. So, when is it good to find out about these mistakes? Now, what's funny is that half the room uh, raised their hand saying they had mistakes, the other half of the room, you don't know you have mistakes on your credit report yet because you haven't seen it lately, okay? <laughs> so um, it's epidemic, gang. I mean, it's really intense. 
So you say to the buyer, look, wouldn't you rather, doesn't it make sense to know if there are any mistakes on your credit report now? Or we checked it last month. Well, something could have happened in 30 days. The mistake could have been put on your credit report in the last 30 days. So you need to get this uh, checked out now rather than you see the house of your dreams, you put it under agreement, you find out you can't get financing anywhere because of this silly little mistake on your credit report because Verizon says you owe them uh, $327 and it's not even you that owes the money. Uh, or it is you and you have to dispute it because they're charging you wrongfully mm -hmm. and now you can't buy the house because of something silly on your credit report so it really makes sense to do that. Arthur, you look unhappy. What is it? Well, it just seems like <laughs> credit reports are going to lose credibility if, if that's happening to millions of people all the time. I mean, people are going to look at it and say, well, there's probably errors and right. so what good is it? Unfortunately, uh, lenders are using them yeah, right now. to get financing. So yeah. I, I agree with you. It is frustrating. They really need to clean it up. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. In addition to that, um, gang, it's identity theft is also epidemic. And that's affecting people's credit reports. And people don't know that their identity has been stolen until after the damage is already done. That's how they find out about it, right? Yeah. So really important uh, that they get pre-approved. And, and this is how I work, gang. Hey, listen, if they don't get pre-approved by my in-house lender, you know, some say, well, we have our own lender, right? And I say to them, well, that's fine. That's no problem. Um, why don't we do this? Um, I don't mind. I'll have Jackie call you anyway, right? Because here's the, here's the bottom line. I trust our in-house lender a lot more than I would their friend, right? Because I know our in-house lender has more at stake, right? And what if they come with the letter, with the pre-approval letter? I've never had that happen. Uh, but if it does happen, um, then uh, that, that's okay. Go to the next step. Yeah, go to the Or I find out, you know, what are the details. Sometimes the letter is, uh, now, you have to know this too. It could be outdated. More importantly, uh, here's another step, gang. Not only may the uh, the credit uh, the uh, the approval be outdated, but there's a difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's right. You know, these these folks are pre-qualified based on their income and their and their their debts, so, and it's subject to having their credit checked. Not all lenders, a lot of lenders will give people a pre-qualification -appro letter without checking their credit or without running them through desktop underwriting, which is a which is a um, a system that uh, loan originators use in order to make sure that these people are qualified. It's almost guaranteed they're getting a loan when they go through that. The reason why they don't want to do that is too much work. <laughs> you know, a lot of these lenders won't do it. So what they, they'll, they'll try to shortcut, give you a letter, and here's what the lender says. Find a house, come and see me, and we'll get you going then. But then there are problems. All of you experienced people, you all know this, you know, Mart's nodding her head, you know, you know, she's been through it, I've been through it personally. They say everything's fine, we go with it. And it's under agreement, and then we have issues. We have problems that could have been prevented had we had them pre-approved by our in-house lender first. Here's another motivation. You're not going to buy the first house you see, are you? If I, if I show you the first house, you're going to buy that one? Or are you going to look at the uh, next one we have scheduled a half an hour later just to compare? What will you do? Compare. compare. Why would you go with the first lender you talked to? But by the way, only say this if they've already gone to another lender. <laughs> right? okay. uh, Otherwise, say, they want to go to yours. Yeah, another. right. <laughs> and say, so, and here's why I'm driving home our in house lender so much. The communication gap is closed, Ken. Right. There's just so much more control over the process. It's so <clears> much you could better. You say everyone's in the loop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there's a huge benefit in that. And, and most people are receptive to that. When you ask them these questions and you point out these points, 90% of the people say, okay, no problem. 10% of the people say, no, I can't do that because this lender, it's my cousin, and he would kill me even if I had my credit checked they got by someone else. Or like right. That, yeah. Here's another myth. Oh, I can't have my credit checked too many times and, and because it lowers my credit yeah. score. That's false. It's not true. Yeah. You can have your credit checked as many times as you want within a 30-day time period as long as it's for shopping for a house, and it will not affect your credit score because they now realize that people shop for loans. If for auto loans, if I did an auto loan uh, search and I went to, you know, 13 different places to check their rates and they had to run my credit, as long as it was just an auto loan in that 30 day period, it would not affect my credit score. So it's fine, you know, it's not a big deal. Yes? Uh, I have a buyer that sat down with her lender this week. 
I don't know who the lender is, but she's waiting for the letter, and then we're going to start looking. If it's a pre-approval letter, do I still have to have her sit down with Jackie? I would call the lender, and I would say, I would recommend it. You don't have to. It's not mandatory. But I would say, listen, I know you're, you're comfortable with that person. How about this? Would you like to get a second opinion, or would you like to compare rates? Right? Or maybe you work with the pre-approval letter, and now yeah, a, a week or two later, you find in the house, you're writing up the offer, they have three to five days to apply for financing, right? And you say to them, why don't I do this? I don't mind. I'm going to have that Jackie person that I met earlier, I'm going to have her give you a call so you can compare rates. And I don't, listen, I, I, That's a good one. I don't That's ask the nice question. I don't say, can I? Listen, I'm a buyer's agent. I'm a, I work with a full service real estate company. And I say to my buyers, if you want to do a good job for your buyers, push them toward our mortgage. You're helping them. I don't even, because I know it's good for them, I don't even ask. I know it's good for them. So I say to them, listen, I'm going to have her call you. You see, if their lender doesn't know that they have any competition, they may increase the points and not even call them points. They might cause them a uh, brokerage fee and put it in the, 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 uh, the HUD statement, right? So uh, these are all things that will certainly help your bar. And by the way, gang, people want help like that. I mean, you know, if, if somebody did that for me, I would thank them. <laughs> you follow me? Wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Right? So do things for your buyers that they will thank you for. Does that make sense? And you'll get more what? Referrals. Right, gang? Right. right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, who's ready for number six? I know I am. Do you have any, do you have any, I love this word. Concerns? Uh, Questions? What was that? Reservations. Lori? Reservations. Objections. Reservations. Do you have any reservations? About employing me exclusively for a minimum of two weeks. I like that word, reservations. I don't make dinner, I make <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Now, uh, let, me, let me talk about that for a minute. Um, what I love about this question, and I kind of tweak this question myself, and I'm patting myself on the back a little bit, what I love about this question is that it gives them an opportunity to say no. And instinctively, People have been around salespeople so much knowing that a salesperson's job is to get them to say all these little yeses. Yeah. How many people have ever heard that? If you get people to say enough little yeses, they'll say a big yes at the end. You know, But it's, it's amazing when people walk into a store and there's a salesperson there, or they walk into a car lot and there's a salesperson runs right up to them and they say, hi, can I help you? And they, what do they say instinctively? No, no I'm just looking. Right. No. See, because instinctively people want to say no when they feel like they're being sold. So if you give them an opportunity to do that, and they're, and they're saying no, and they're closing themselves at the same time, it's just a beautiful thing. It's just <laughs> something I kind of get excited about. Anyway, I know you're probably thinking, John, you need to get a life. But anyway, I get pretty excited about it. <laughs> so do you have any reservations about employing me exclusively for a minimum no. of two weeks? And, um, and you can look at them and say this. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, here's why I say two weeks. Now, John, what do you mean when you say two weeks? Shouldn't our exclusive buyer contract be for six months? Well, sure it should. But listen, gang, if you can't find them a house and sit in two weeks, and they're not moving in the direction that you'd like them to, and they're not cooperating and qualifying, you don't want to be beholden to them for six months. You want to you don't want you want to let them go in two weeks. You want to fire them. You follow me? Because while you're spending more than two weeks or two months or two years working with these people, that's time you as a valuable human being who can offer phenomenal services to a lot of wonderful people, your time is all taken up now. You're not available because you're working with this and these other people. Here's what happens. I hear people answer the phone sometimes. I can tell when somebody has a buyer to show buyers homes on the weekends. Because the answer is, the agents answer the phone, and when they get a lead, an opportunity to show a house uh, on the weekend, they, they kind of blow the buyer off. They put obstacles in the way of the buyer. Well, do you have a pre-approval? They automatically start to get real cocky. They don't start building rapport. They go right to the qualifying on the phone right away because they're trying to blow this buyer off because the agent is too busy. But here's the sad part, gang. They're too busy 
not making money. You know, this business is a great business. You can make a tremendous amount of money per hour in this business, or you can work your butt off day and night and weekends and not make anything because you're spending time with the wrong people. Okay, gang? <laughs> so, uh, number seven. I mean, don't look, don't look so serious, guys. I mean, you know, we're lighting up a little bit. The good news is you're here. I'm providing you with the information. I'm showing you how to make the most amount of money per hour, right? Number seven, we're going to do a thorough search through the computer. And, and gang, here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, if everyone could please follow with me. And everyone say the word computer. Ready? Go. Computer. Take out the word MLS out of your vocabulary, gang, because you're the only one that knows what that means. The average human being in, uh, out in the real world, outside of real estate, right, thinks that MLS stands for Major League Soccer. Okay? <laughs> and you say, I'm going to take you through Major League Soccer, and we're going to pick the best. And they're like, what do you think of MLS? Right? <laughs> Stop using that term. You know, here's what I hear agents say all the time, even on listing appointments. Well, you're familiar with the MLS, right? And the agent goes like this. And so the buyer or seller, is to not appear stupid, goes, sure, we know what it is. They don't know what it is. They're just agreeing with you, figuring that you're going to say something in the next sentence that will give them a clue as to what it really is. So stop using MLS and CMA and XYZ and ABC. Uh, they really don't know. Uh, okay, GMAC? Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and pick the best blank to bank blank homes. What? Three to five. Three to five. five. Oh. All right, Diane. Diane's honing in on that three to five. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. Then we'll view the homes, pick the one you like the best, come back to this office, and write up the paperwork, or you can change it to go over the details, like we said earlier, whatever you feel comfortable saying. I like that, you know, write up the paperwork or go over the paperwork. Cross out that word write up. I don't like that at all. Yeah, no. well, go Who wrote that? I think go I did. Over yeah. The yeah, go over the details or uh, go over the paperwork. Okay. And then you just simply say to them, how does working this way seem to you? And most people will say yes. People, you know, here's what I found. People who don't want to buy a house will say no. See, this again, folks, is one of the only infallible things that I could possibly share with you is the system of working with buyers. It's the only thing that I can show you that works every single time. Because when they say no to any one of these questions, or, or they respond negatively, I should say, to any one of these questions, then you don't work with them, you win. You follow me? If they respond yes, you're in control, you show three or five homes, and you win. Either way, you what? You win, right? Um, now, something I want to share with you is uh, a technique. This is a technique that I uh, think is just uh, fantastic. And I don't remember whether I made it up myself or whether I learned it from someone else or whether I used it for something else and then I adopted it for real estate, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, here's, here, let me give you an example, okay? Um, I went into the, to the clothier, right? And he shows me all these uh, ties, you know? That's a bow tie. <laughs> Sorry. This is no I'm not an artist. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So he shows me these four ties. And these ties. That's a tie. Yeah. That's an ugly tie. Yeah. Yeah. So he shows me these four ties and he says, John, um, here are the ties I picked out that would go with this suit, these four ties. See, he wants me to just pick out one tie, because when I pick out one tie, what have I done? Well, eliminated the others. Made a decision. No, I just bought a tie. Yeah. Come on, folks, work with me. <laughs> These are salespeople too, right? Yeah. If he doesn't bring out four ties and say pick one, 
Or if he just goes to the rack and says, hey, go pick out a tie, I'm going to go like, yeah, I probably have one at home that will probably match, right? Mm -hmm. And you get a new suit, you want to get a new tie with that, right, gentlemen? Yeah. You know what I'm saying, right? Ladies, you get a new handbag, you want to get a pair of what to match? Shoes, Shoes right? <laughs> right? So now, um, so now he comes to me and he says, all right, John, I'm going to gear this toward houses now. Are you ready? Uh, we looked at these four ties. Tie one, two, three, and four. And what I'm going to do is let's pretend this is the suit, right? And I'm going to say, okay, <coughs> if you had to choose just between these two ties to match with this suit, which one would you like the best? And Mark, which one do you like the best? I'll take number two. Number two. So what does that do to number one, gang? Eliminates. Eliminates. Okay, now I picked out this third and fourth tie to go with this suit. And between, uh, Mark, between tie number two and number three, to go with this suit, which one do you think matches the best? I like my two. Two again? So what does that do to number three, gang? Get rid of it. Number three. Right? Uh, Mark, if two and four were the last two ties in the world to choose from, and you had to pick one and only one to match with this suit, which one would you pick? I'll stick to my number two. Stick to that. What happens to number four, gang? Oh, now, what happens with a house? What happens with a house? What happens with a house? When you go out and you show them five properties, right? And they come back at the end of the day and you say, okay, let's sit down and go over the paperwork. And in their mind, this is what they see. <laughs> they see these five homes, right? That's a townhouse. <laughs> What's that? A ranch. ranch, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Let's say this is a let's say this is a this is a cape. Okay. All right. So now, um, what happens is they see all five of these homes in their mind. And gang, if you take one valuable thing away from today, this is such a great technique because here's what happens to most agents: they go out, they do everything right. And they get to the point where they show them the homes, they show them all five homes, and when they're all done, they even do the right thing by bringing them back to the office, and they bring them back to the office, and when they're back at the office, they say, okay, so what do you think? Bam. Well, they start talking, and they start saying, well, um... We like the one with the orange countertops, but we didn't like the size of the backyard. And you say, oh, no, wait a minute. That one did have a good size backyard. I think you're referring to the one with the brown kitchen cabinets and the linoleum floor. Oh, no, that wasn't that one. That was the one with the green sofa in the front living room. Remember how bright green that sofa was? And, and how, you know, and they start confusing the houses because they've only seen each of them for maybe half an hour, 20 minutes apiece. So imagine the power of the technique, and here's what I do as part of my safe island dialogue with the buyer gang. What I do is I go through and I explain to them, I said, listen, we're going to go out and we're going to see three to four homes. And I draw three to four homes on a piece of paper for them. And I said, here's what we're going to do before we go out. I'm going to ask you to only compare two at a time. And they say, what do you mean two at a time? Well, the problem is if you look at all five and you try to compare all five at the same time, most people find it extremely confusing and complex and, 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 and it's frustrating. So what we're going to do is here's the dialogue that I'm going to use with you. Here's the safe island. Here's the dialogue that I'm going to use with you, Judy, when we go out and we look at these homes. We're going to look at the first home and I'm going to say, Judy, what do you think about this house? And you're going to probably tell me, well, I want to compare it to the other one before I make a decision if I want to buy that property. And I'll say, okay. But Judy, I'm going to ask you this question at the end of every, because I was trained, I learned in real estate school, to ask you this question. I'm going to show you house number one, I'm going to ask you if you want to buy it, okay? <laughs> and you're going to say, probably, you know, I want to compare it to house number two. And I'm going to say, okay, so we're going to go to house number two, right? So I go over to house number two, and then at this point, Judy, here's what I'm going to say to you. I'm going to say, Judy, between house number one and house number two, if these were the last two homes on earth, and you had to pick one and only one, and they were both at the same price... Which one would you pick, one or two? Two. Two. Okay, so that eliminates number what, gang? Number one. one, right? Now, Judy, when we go to see house number three, um, you see where I'm going with this, Judy? Yeah. Right? <laughs> we'll go to see house number three. Let's just play along for the fun of it. Between house number two and house number three, if these were the last two homes on earth and you had to pick one, notice my dialogue, you had to pick one. Okay. And they were both at the same what, gang? Price. Price. Which one would you pick? Two. 
See, because sometimes they want to get price in the mix. Oh, I like what, to. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh. I apologize. <laughs> All right. That's okay. Two is uh, put a little halo around there it. How's that? Go. House number two. In between house number two and four, which one? I go with two. Two? So that takes out number four. <coughs> two and five? I go with two. You still like house number two? The two one. So That's now, why I picked it. <laughs> and they're all the same price. And see, what I've done is I've taken out the fact that, well, this one's offered at 389 and this one's offered at 350 So they're looking at the 350 one like a better value, and they're confusing which one they should go for. Right. When in reality, maybe we can get the one for 389 for 350 but more importantly, that doesn't matter. We're looking in your price what, gang? Price range. range. We're looking in your price range. You can afford everything I'm going to show you. Well, which one do you really like? Which one do you really like the best? Because when it all comes down, if you're going to live the next <coughs> 10 to 30 years in this house, like don't you want it to be the one that you like the most? Yeah. And they look at me and they go, yeah. I've had buyers look at me and literally say, wow, that's genius. <laughs> I said, <laughs> well, Great, I'm glad you like it. I said, you could use that when you're going out. The, let's say there are three different movies that you want to see one night. Eliminate, only compare, two at a time. Okay, gang? Could you use this for other things in life? Absolutely. Right? Very, very, very powerful technique. Buyers love it, and you're giving them the best service possible. And the other beautiful thing about it is when you go back to the office to go over the details, you're not going over the details for how many houses. Five. One. You know what happens with most low producing agents? They go back to the office and the buyers are so confused. They're like, we don't know. We just, we don't know which one, you know, because we kind of like these two and, you know, one in the third. What about the third one? I like the third one. And she says, well, I, you know, I didn't like that one at all. And, and here's what they do. They cuddle up next to you, Judy, and they say, well, let, let's, let's look on the computer some more, Judy. Come on, let's. And, 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 and then the agent goes over, not Judy, but the agent goes over and shows them more homes on the computer, makes more appointments, and this just goes on and on and on until the buyer, you know, just dies from boredom, is frustrated, they can't find the home they want, or they're happy because they're just getting decorating ideas and they have nothing else better to do on Sunday, and they're waiting for prices to go down while rates go up, right? <laughs> Come on, gang, right? Can you see how this could change a real estate agent's life just knowing these facts today? Right? And I'm not even done yet. You want more? Yes. All right. <laughs> how to increase sales, part number two. We're going to go a little quicker now. Uh, which should you take with you on a showing? The address and phone number or all the information about the house? What do you take with you on a listing presentation? Um, what do I tell you? The house. Everything, everything, right? Yeah. What should you take with you when you go to show a house? Uh, nope, nothing. <laughs> Off of you're good. The address and phone number. But John, I'll make sure I cover that in a moment. <laughs> I know this is, is shocking some of you right now, but I have some, uh, some good things to share with you. Remember what I always say, if I'm only sharing with you some things that you already know that you're already doing, then all I'm doing is helping you continue to get what you're getting right now. In order to improve, in order to make a difference, I need to share with you things that are different than what you've been hearing, what other agents in your office are doing and saying, and what you're currently doing right now in order to make an effective change in what it is that you do and, and the results that you get from it. Okay? You all with me on that? Yeah. yeah. All right. Number four. Well, the, the address of, what's the phone number? The address of the property you're going to see and the phone number of the agent that has the block box to Correct. Do it. Exactly. Yes. Uh, number four is before you show them a house, you should A, point out all the good features, or B, prepare them for the worst. A. A. B. B. The answer is B, prepare them for the worst. And I'm going to cover that too. I'm going to share with you why that is so important. Oh, that's like it creates reverse urgency. Reverse psychology. Yeah, well, exactly. It's like reverse psychology. Absolutely. You know, the, the, element, of, the element of pleasant surprise creates urgency. Okay, it's when showing a house, A, make sure the seller is always present, B, let the seller show it for you, or C, let the buyers discover it for themselves. C, C is correct. Number two, if a buyer points out a negative about the house, A, ignore it, B, turn it into a positive, or C, don't worry about it unless they want to buy it, or D, any of the above. Ooh, D is correct. 
You know, Andre learned a long time ago that whenever D is an option, that is the answer. I don't know how many times I have to tell you this. It never changes. Whenever you have all of the above, that is the answer. Okay. Right, Andre? You're good. The best way to stay in control when showing a house is to A, walk in front of them facing backwards. I love that. Uh, B, walk behind them and step on their heels and give them a poke in the butt if they're going too slow, right? Or C, ask questions. You got it. Ask questions. We're going to go over that. Absolutely. I'll make sure I cover that. Now, uh, in the last segment, I gave you three rules to sell more homes, right? With fewer showings. Right? I gave you some rules to sell more homes with fewer showings. In this segment, I'm going to give you three more nuggets. Uh, also, uh, selling more with fewer showings. And uh, that's what it's all about, right, gang? Isn't it? Some of you look really tired right now. I mean, I'm the one doing all the work up here. I mean, you're just sitting down absorbing all this. You look pretty tired, right? Some people do what they want to what? Here, you know, where are we? It reminds me. Are we all one four? Where is the one, two, and three? Oh yeah, we don't have the four. We don't have the We have four and five and six. We started at four, five, and six. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's right. No problem. Um, no, no. Hey, listen, listen, gang. Uh, there are. It's a continuation from the previous page. So I gave you three. I'm going to give you three more, so you should have four on your page. Rule number four, right? Yeah. I'm going to give you three more rules, but they're numbered four, five, and six. You scared me there for a minute, right? We got it. All right. Um, you know, when people hear what they want to hear, you know, when I always talk about this subject, people hear what they want to hear. Even though they were here and they heard something, they still continue to go out to do it something different because people have the money. It reminds me of that couple. They were sitting on a park bench, and uh, the man looked over at the woman. And he said, uh, hey, how are you doing? And she said, okay. And he says, so uh, what do you do? And she said, well, actually, I've been in prison. for." He said, really, for how long? She said, for 30 years. He goes, wow, what happened? He said, well, I shot my husband, put him in a freezer. Two years later, they found him, and they caught me, and they put me in jail. He says, oh, so you're single. <laughs> People hear what they want to hear. <laughs> so, so again, gang. <laughs> I know they're laughing too much. It's kind of scary. I'm feeling uh, kind of cold right now. Yes, I'm feeling kind of cold. <laughs> 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 it's a chilly. Uh, rule, rule number four: <laughs> turn the negatives into positives. Rule number four: turn the negatives into positives. I'm going to give you three techniques. That when you're hit with an objection, um, uh, three different things that you can do. Um, you know, let me give you an example of turning a negative into a positive. This is one way you can handle it. For instance, let's say the house has really small bedrooms. You might want to use a dialogue similar to this. Before you get into the property, you stop at the door. Before you go into the lockbox, you look at the sellers and the buyers, and you say, "Listen, um, this builder was an absolute genius." You know, here's what I mean by that. In a, when building a home, you have two base, you can only get so much, when you're buying a home, you only get so much square footage for the what? Money. For the money, right? And what this builder did is he, there are two different types of rooms. There are primary rooms and there are secondary rooms. The primary rooms are the living room, dining room, and kitchen. That's where you spend most of your time, right? And then there are the secondary rooms, and those are called the bedrooms, of course. And so what the builder did in this property is he took the inches away from the bedrooms, the, the secondary rooms, and gave more inches to the primary rooms. You follow me? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we go in and we see the property, and now they see it in a different way. So I turn the negative. What's the negative? They have small what? Small bedrooms. Small bedrooms. Bedrooms. small bedrooms. And the positive is? Larger primary rooms. Larger primary rooms. Right, larger primary rooms. So that's an example of putting, uh, and I put some... Um, you know, like a property is, uh, let's say I gave another hint down there, I put the properties in disrepair. I mean, it's it's a fixer-upper. And again, you only get so much square footage for your what? Money. Money. So what's the benefit of turning the negative that it's in disrepair? What's the positive? You get more, you can fix it for less, and you can get it out. Yeah, absolutely. You get more for less, right? More square footage for less. Number five. Take blank with you on a showing. Now, based on the five questions I just asked you, what should you take with you? What's the answer? All the decision makers. 
Well, that's good. Yes, absolutely. That definitely applies. Uh, but this is uh, something different. I'm going to ask you to write down nothing. Take nothing with you on a showing. Because what do some agents do when they're showing a property? They take, they take the file of all the stuff. In fact, they do all the research on all the properties. They pulled up the deeds, the field cards, the, uh, the septic tank plans uh, at, the town, uh, at the town hall, and everything with them on the property. And why do agents take all this stuff with them when they're going out to show a property? In case the buyer has a what? Question. 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 Right, Ken? Yeah. You have to go back to the office for that. Right. See, you got it right on. Mm -hmm. See, if you have all the answers to all your questions with you, you have no reason to go back to the where? The office, the office right? Yeah. That's definitely a, a, good, a very good point. Um, but um, whenever I say don't take anything with you on a showing, uh, whenever, regardless of the group I've spoken in front of, I can always tell when they disagree with something because they're sitting there and they're, they're, they're two there are two agents sitting next to each other, look at each other, and all of a sudden they go... <laughs> Shouldn't you have right? a notepad to do that, John? Hold on. Hold that thought. <laughs> I know that it's... You start wiggling in your chair. Well, what if they have a question? And here's what I've heard agents say. I've heard agents... It is completely different than what you used to, right? Yeah. Uh, but again, if you want completely different results compared to what you used to, follow this plan. And I'll, I'll sell you on it. Are you ready? Here's why. Um, when... Um, Number one, I know that you don't buy in most of the time when I talk to people about this. Um, when buyers ask you a question, okay, uh, like I put down in, in your notes here, what is the lot size, right? Didn't I put that down yes, there? Yes. You know, what is the lot size? And here's what that agent does like this. They go, hmm, let me see. And, and they take out the form and the paper and they, uh, the lot size is 90 by 20. Everyone, give me a round of applause for that, please. I said 90 by 20. Yeah, you know, I went to school to learn how to do that. I, I read it just right. Didn't I do good? All right, 90 by 120. Yes, that's the lot size. And um, again, that's what the low producing agent does. See, here's what top producers do who are working with buyers. Top producers do this. Here's what they think in their mind. You ready? Uh, ask me what the lot size is. Ready? Go. What's, what's, the, the, lot lot size? what's the difference? <laughs> now, I don't want you to say that, but I want you to think that. Because, gang, truly, what is the difference? It doesn't matter what the lot size is. What matters is this. What matters is you say to the buyer and you say, well, we can always look that up um, in the sheet inside the house, or maybe we can go back to the office and check that out. But let me ask you a question. How do you feel about the size of this lot? Is it too big? <laughs> right? How do you feel about it? Because people don't, you know, buying is still an emotional decision. There's nobody sitting there with uh, a spreadsheet. Yeah, I know you might have one buyer that you know that did this, but has a spreadsheet that's comparing all these things, right? And coming up with the best value. Because even if there's a guy out there that does that, there's a woman that's out there that says, no, we're buying this one. Yes, but the square footage and the parameter and the distance of the frontage and the whole, and she's going to say, I like this one better. How did she like that one better? How did he like that one better? They felt it, right? So you always go back to feelings, gang. How do you feel about this yard? Well, it's way too small. I could never put my tractor back here, and, you know, I really wanted room for a garden. Okay, right? Um, how about this one? How much are the taxes? Ready? Ask me. How much are the taxes? And I think what? As a top producer, I think what? What's the difference? Ready? Everybody say it together. I'm going to ask what? you. I'm going to ask you. You ready? Uh, agent, what are the taxes? And you say, what's, what's the, the difference? difference? What's the difference? <laughs> Some of you can't even say that right now. It's so <laughs> objectionable to, you, to your way of thinking. Like, what's the difference? Well, here's, here's the thing. Remember at the last seminar I said you have a, go with your, look at your alternatives. Your alternatives are you can give them the information. Yeah, and they don't need you anymore. They have too much information. And here's what happens. When people have too much information, they can't decide to decide. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And here's what you can simply say. I even wrote it down for you. I'm not sure, but we can get that information, and we can use it toward your monthly payment. Right? And add it into part of your pre-approval and figure that out. And they just go, okay, and they keep doing what? Okay. Looking at the house. And by the way, gang, when a buyer says any one of those two things, you know what kind of signals those are? 
buying signals, right? They're buying signals. Well, they walk into the master bedroom. What is the size of this room? The average agent pulls out the paper, MLS form. It's not in the form. They run out to their car, they get their tape measure and a piece of paper, and they measure out the room and blah, 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 blah. Instead, what does the pro do? The pro says, does it look like this bedroom size will work for you? Yeah, I think we could get our armoire over in the corner. We might have to put it, put it a little bit closer to the window than I'd like, but we could fit the, fit the bed in, blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay. That's what the pro does. The pro takes what with them on, on showings? What do they take with them? Nothing. 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 That's phone what number. the pro does. What's that? The phone number. The phone number, right, to the agent. <laughs> where can I fax you the offer? That's where I want the, I, I want the phone number, right? You want the addresses of where you're going. In the addresses, absolutely. <laughs> Mark, very good. You got it. Uh, but here's what happens. Unfortunately, agents, they print out the full MLS data sheet. They, you got the address and the phone numbers all on there. And I would caution you, don't take all that stuff with you. Here's even worse. I've seen this, I know, because I did this when I was a low producing agent. I actually gave them the MLS sheets and said, here are the properties we're going to be touring, and here's a map of the neighborhood, and blah, blah, blah. And here's a comp on every single one of the four houses we've seen, and what properties have sold, and pending, and active, and blah. And it's like, wow. <laughs> but the bottom line is, which house did they buy? They bought the one that they what? They felt good about, the one that they liked the most. Right, gang? See, what happens, we got into some bad habits and we got away from helping people buy. Instead, we're trying to sell. You think that by having all the information, you're going to look like more of a pro, but you're yeah, only hurting yourself and you're only hurting them. Yeah. Because you want to give them that perception that I have all the answers. You know what, gang? You, in years ago, you did. Yeah. But today, they do. They have all the answers. They, they know what the taxes and the square footage is. We used to be the keepers of the information. Now they have everything that we pay for free, what we pay money for to get. <laughs> right? All the MLS data. So stay away from that. And I even tell buyer, if a buyer showed up with, a, with an MLS listing sheet of everyone, I said, listen, do me a favor. Leave that here in the office now. We'll come back and we'll refer to this information because I've often found that it interferes with people making the right decision. In other words, instead of looking at the house and getting a feel for it, you're, you're looking at the piece of paper, looking at the square footage and the room sizes, and then and you're really not feeling the house. So if you don't mind, let's leave that stuff here and see how it feels to look at homes just by looking at homes. <laughs> and they go, wow, yeah, okay, John, that makes sense. Rule of thumb, gang, the more information you give them at the house, the fewer reasons they need to sit down and talk turkey with you. <laughs> right? Louise, you're good. You were like two paragraphs ahead of me. You're, you got it. No, you were. You said that just a few minutes ago. Now you're back. If you give them all the information, they have they have no reason. Yeah, Judy, you said that. I'm sorry. Yeah. They have no reason to go back and talk, sit down and talk turkey with you. Sales are lost at the house because we give them too much what? Information. information. That's correct. Information. They either blank it or they don't feel it. They either yeah. feel it or they don't feel it when they look at that home. Rule number six, always go out and prepare them for the worst, not the best. Always go out and prepare them for the worst, not the best. What was it? They either feel it or they don't, or they don't feel it. it. Here's another rule of thumb again. You ready? <laughs> the higher the expectations, the harder they what? Wow. The harder they fall. The higher the expectations, the harder they fall. Can you give us an example, John, of yeah. preparing them for the worst? Sure. Like I'm the, glad you asked that question. In fact, if you look right down at the next sentence, if a property is super clean, you go. the agent says, this might be the one uh, that might need a lot of cleaning, right? And because you've caravaned it and you know that it's super clean, right? And you open the, and you, you can even smile with them, and eventually it'll become a joke. You know, they'll know that you're doing this, and you can even joke around about doing this if you want, depending on the type of rapport you have with these people. And they go in, and they look at the property, and they see that it's, that it's clean, right? Or you say, you know, uh, this place might be a real dump when we go in here. The last time I saw it, there was a lot of clutter, there was a lot of mess. The seller was supposed to do some things, but I don't know if they did. So be prepared for what you see in here. And what they do is they walk in and they go, well, that isn't, this isn't that bad. 
And by the way, your definition of clean might be different than someone else's definition of clean, too. You might think the place is sparkling, and they may walk in and say, that's eh, all right. So don't, don't talk about any of the positives before you go into a property. Remember, gang, you know the best way to sell a house is don't sell it. Let the what? The Let the house sell itself, right? The best thing you can do is manage expectations. That's the only thing you can do is manage expectations. Let's say the house has great room sizes, and you say, I'm not sure your, your, uh, your bedroom furniture, you said you had a king size bed, I'm not sure your bedroom furniture is going to fit in this master bedroom. Well, let's go and check it out. And they walk in, and, they, and they're expecting to see this little room with a slanted ceiling go right over the bed, and, and, and they walk in, and they go, wow, right? Hey, this will work. This will work for us. And now they're buying. See, the average agent, I hear agents out there doing this. When we go out on caravan, uh, you ladies know this. We all go, and, and gentlemen, you know this. We go on caravan together. We go out there. And sometimes the agent will lead us around by the nose and try to sell us the property as if we're buying it and tell us all the great things about the house. When if they were smart, they would say, geez, you know what? I don't know if um, there are enough bedrooms upstairs, enough bedroom upstairs for any buyers that you have. But when you go up there, check it out and see what you think. You know, um, I'm covering this, you know, how about this one? It has a finished basement. You know it has a finished basement. So listen, I know you're looking some, for some additional room for the family room, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think this house has a finished basement. I'm not even sure that this basement is suitable to be finished. And they walk down and they see this professionally finished basement. And they go, wow, right? Yeah, but don't they think you're a little bit cool? Yeah, they don't know you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's the deal. Guy. Well, here's the deal. The reason why you're thinking that is because I'm hammering you with these one after the other, one after the other. But if I, have, if I say one semi-negative thing about every house, you're not going to know what I'm doing. I'm just giving you these examples one after the other, like rapid fire. So it might sound that way right now. But if you were looking at homes with me, I would make sure that it didn't sound like I was just saying negative things about every room of the house. In other words, I wouldn't say all these things about every house, about one house. I would say it about, you know, different houses. Uh, the secret to selling, gang, the element of blank, blank creates blank. The element of pleasant surprise creates what? Sense of urgency. 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 And urgency creates a what? Sale. Andre, a sale, right? <laughs> you got it. Okay. Now, would this apply to when you're doing an open house? When you're doing an open house, you usually tend to tell them about the good things. Yeah, you absolutely. Know. Like at an open house, I would say to them, listen, um, I don't know how you feel about hanging around outside. They have a porch, but, you know, some people don't like a porch. <coughs> and, and they go out there, and there's this beautiful deck, and it's all screened in, and so they can't get any mosquitoes after them or anything like that. Or, you know... Uh, and, you know, and they might go in there and they might say, you know what, yeah, I hate this porch. And now they like you because you like what they like. And or they, 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 they walk out on the porch and they say, wow, actually, that, that realtor, you know, is wrong. I like this porch. This is a good porch. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, absolutely, you can use that in an open house. Uh, you can't say to them, look, I don't know if this house has a porch or not because, yeah, because you've already went through the house. You know, you have to... Work yourself carefully. <laughs> so great salespeople always do three things. Let's recap. Number one, they turn negatives into what, gang? Nothing. They take blank with them on a showing. Nothing. 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 What do they take with them? Nothing. Nothing. I just wanted to hear the lovely word again. Okay, and always go out and prepare them for the worst, not the best. You will literally sell more homes with fewer showings using these techniques. How to increase sales, part what? Three. Part three, the most important things to watch for on a showing are buying signals, changes in the weather, or flaws in the house. Buying signals. Absolutely. Number four, when you see buying signals, you should do something as opposed to nothing. Close softly, yet definitely. Walk on eggs back to the office or all of the above. Uh, all all of the above. above. You got it. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are good. <laughs> Buyers are more likely to make a buying decision, A, standing in the parking lot looking at their watch, or B, sitting in the office with their questions answered. B. You know, there's something real important, gang, and I'm going to say this a few times. People only make a decision when they're sitting on their <coughs> butts, okay? So you want to get them to sit down. Number two, ask them to buy every house you show them because, A, it's the least you can do, B, they won't close themselves, or C, they expect it. C. C. The answer is 
A. a. It's the least you can do. And it really is the least you can do. <laughs> Number one, always show the buyers, A, what they tell you that they're looking for, B, in-house inventory, or C, just the ones they pick out. And the answer is B, in-house inventory, because it closes the communication gap. So what you want to do is if you have, you want to look at our interior listings first and try to sell them first, because of the, the benefit is that you close the gap of communication and it's a much better process. Now, there's nothing you can say to get them to buy a house that they don't like, but if you have an opportunity to show an in-house listing, you, it's, it's so much. How many of you ever co broke with another co broke from another company and it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant? Raise your hand, right? Because of the gap of communication that went on, right? So it's always better if you can sell something in house. Uh, selling more houses and fewer showings, right, gang? That's what we're here for. Based on the previous six nuggets that I gave you, uh, would you agree that they could help you make more sales? Yes or no? Yes. yes. All right. Here's another point I want to point out, and that is this. Most racers are won or are lost, not in the first three quarters of the race, but in the last quarter of the race. Right? Final stretch. The final stretch. Now, you've come this far, right, gang? <laughs> Here are the last three nuggets, and these three nuggets, they take a little fortitude. Are you, are you ready for this? Yeah. Example, when the buyer throws out an objection, when a buyer throws out an objection, <laughs> For you new people, they're not saying they don't want to buy it, okay? When they throw an objection, they're not saying they don't want to buy it. Here's a rule of thumb. The more they object, the more buying signals they're throwing at us. The more they object, the more buying signals they're throwing at us. For instance, a buyer walks in the house and they look at this wall and they say, hmm, that wall's going to have to come down if we're going to, you know, because we, we want it to be open. Some agents give up and say, all right, well, that ends this house. Let's go look at the next one. And they put an X through house number one because they have to knock out that wall. Where the good agent would look at it and say, hmm, how much, uh, Andre, how much do you think it would cost to do that? I mean, can you do that? I mean, is that a load-bearing wall? Or, I mean, what, what do you think? Would you have to put a beam in there? Or... Two, three hundred dollars. Really? Wow, you're good. That's pretty good. <laughs> so this could work for you then, maybe? Absolutely. All right. You see the difference, Tim? Right? <laughs> Rule number seven, our number one job is to look for blank, blank, buying signals. Your number one job is not leading the way. Too many agents I see through, you know, here's another, this, this used to crush me. I'd be working with my buyer and the co-broke agent, the listing agent, would be at the property. It would drive me insane. I would always, always ask them to just leave us alone. Because here's what, the, here's what the listing agent thinks that they should be doing. They hand my buyer. Now, knowing what I know and knowing what you know, wouldn't it just kill you if you've done everything you could to keep all the information away from the buyer and take nothing with you on the show? And you get to the property, and the listing agent says, oh, here's a, um, here's a listing sheet uh, right here, Ken. And what I'd like you to do, and they take you by the nose, and they pull you over here, and they say, okay, I want to show you this. And, and, this, and by the way, Ken, the taxes are, if you look right there, you can see the and over here is the, and look at, and Ken's so busy being entertained by this realtor, and oh, and let me tell you about the school system, and Ken's just being polite going, oh, I don't even have any kids, but <laughs> <laughs> right, and the agent's going, blah, 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 and you're sitting there like, come on already, and you know, you, you're looking at your watch, wait, you know, because you got to get to the next house, and this agent's going to shutting up, and the bottom line is, they walk out of the property thinking like, what the heck just happened, all they did was look at a piece of paper, and a realtor, and a bunch of information, they didn't get a chance to feel the house. So what you do is sometimes you have to take that listing agent aside and say, listen, these buyers are special buyers. And what I want, and what I mean by that is that they, the way that they like to buy a house and the, chance, the odds of them actually buying your property is, listen, I, they already have all the information they need uh, to make a decision to see this house. What I'd like to do is how about you and I go outside while they're inside, and when they go inside, you and I go outside, and I, I, I bet that there's a greater chance that you're going to make a commission on this house if you and I do that, because I know these people. What do you think? Good idea. The listing agent <laughs> says, the listing agent goes, okay. And they think, well, I have well, all this information. I said, listen, should they decide to buy the property or should they decide they're interested based on the getting a chance to fill the house, I will definitely let you give the full blown presentation and everything that they need to know about the property. But for right now, they just need to feel whether or not it's the right house for them. 
Okay. Mm. See, I, I, as an agent, I spent a lot of my time coaching other agents, whether they had the listing property or whether I was a listing agent. I had to coach them through the process of getting out of the way so they wouldn't do what? Screw Sorry. up the deal. So what I was trying to do was help them screw up fewer so we could both make more sales. You follow me? <laughs> what happens when it's your person, the yes. buyer, and you're going around and the, that other person is there, the, uh, the other realtor, and your buyer says to them, hey, what, uh, by the way, what are the taxes on this house? Doesn't ask you, ask that other person. Yeah, well, there's nothing you can do. you got to go outside you the gotta, house. you got to let them answer it. I mean, here's what blows my mind, gang. Feel this, okay? This is, what, this is a real pet peeve of mine. The listing agent asks who to leave prior to the showing. The owners. They ask the owner to leave the house. Why? So the buyers feel what? More comfortable. And then they show up. Right. <laughs> and for all of you doing accompanied showings, I hope you go there, open the door, and get out of the way. Make yourself invisible. Yeah. Now I got two salespeople here. Yeah, it's horrible. It's Does horrible. Does that happen often, John? Yes. I don't remember when I was in the business before. Yep. That didn't happen to me. But they do it more and more. Yeah, really. Even at an inspection, I was just yeah. at an inspection, and the people said that they were so glad that the listing agent wasn't there this time because at the last place they were at, the listing agent piled them all around during the inspection, yeah. and they oh, couldn't no. even. It was you know, defending every little flaw and yeah, telling them why it's not yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Look, just yeah. leave us alone. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes, um, Louise. If you have a listing and you are the listing agent, should you have a sheet with information on it there, or do, should you also not you have anything? You can have it in a book on the okay. counter. And maybe invite them to take it when they when they leave. No, no. if they want it, it's, there. Take, it's an information book. If they want to look at the information, they'll open the book and look at it. It's there. So if put it in a file that says information. Just leave a it on three the ring binder with clear sheet protectors so okay. that it doesn't leave the house. Okay. It stays there. Oh, you know, okay. here's another thing. You guys are all printing forms out like crazy off these yeah. color printers. All these MLS sheets with all the all the pictures. And people do take them off your listings, but they're just doing it as a courtesy. You know what they're doing? They're taking oh, all of it the, and they're putting up all five on a table at their house and they're going, this is the one and that was this one, because they're not using this system that I just shared with you. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? And, so, and you're wasting your time, energy, so, and effort, and money on all these beautiful brochures. People are taking them who aren't buying the house. So if you're having an open house, what would you say to me? <laughs> if I'm having, I am having an open house on sure. Sunday. This yes. Next, not this one, but the next one. Well, yep. what you say to me to if, do? About what? About what you when have, buyers what come in with agents. I, when they come in, I say, hi, you know, my name is Louise, um, and I'm just, I'm just here to keep the door open, and, and uh, what I'd ask you to do is just sign in, if you would, please, and uh, there'll be a question there, you know, do you have an agent and all that other good stuff. Just sign in, if you would, please. What you want to do is you want to sign in a name yourself so that they, when they walk in, it looks like somebody already signed in before you so that um, they're more apt to fill it in. I mean, here's what happens. If you've ever seen a list, right, <clears throat> like if uh, a sign-up sheet, if, if the first two people just put their name in and don't fill out the phone number or the email, Everybody the other people won't either. either. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so put in the name, the, phone, the address, the phone number, the email address, and all that. Okay. And there then say, is some and then, information on the property at an open house. Yes. yes. Yes, but she's saying if she's doing an open house, right? Yeah. And uh, you know what? Keep the information on the, on the kitchen counter if you need it. You're probably never going to need it. But um, you know what? I take with bring some offer forms in case someone wants to buy the house. You know, take that. You know, make sure your agency disclosure placard is displayed yes, uh, on the property. Um, and then what I used to like to say to people at an open house is, listen, I'm just here to keep the door open uh, for people to come in. If you would be so kind as to sign in. I always made a little joke. I always said, if you could sign in, that way the seller doesn't think I'm sitting here eating all their snacks and watching their TV. <laughs> and they would laugh and they kind of break the ice, break the tension yeah. a little bit. And, and, say, and then I would say to them, hey, listen, make yourselves at home. I'm just here to answer any questions. I'll stay out of your way. And then I walk away from them. You know, it's something interesting when you, uh, and women are really good at this when they're dating, is that when, they, when you walk away, it makes the other person follow you, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, <clears throat> so it's like something that you can't, you don't have to worry about. Um, fall, other agents follow them around, and they don't get a chance to feel for the house. They try to build rapport and be their friend and all that stuff. You know, before they leave, you have a series of questions that you learn in the Foundations for Success program. Uh, and if you don't have those, I can fax them to you or, or we can get them for you. Um, 
but things that you can't ask them at the open house. But let them feel the house first. Let them build a little rapport by letting them relax. Is it appropriate to go sit out on the front porch and yeah. wait? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and then tell them, say, hey, listen, when you're inside, I'm outside. When you're outside, I'll be inside. I'm only here to answer any questions that you have. But before they leave, you don't want to ch run and chase them out to the car. Uh, but just say to them, you know, uh, catch up with me before you take off uh, so that I can get your feedback. I just want to be able to give it to the seller. Good, That's thank all. You. And then I just go like this. Yeah. And I walk away. See, I'm doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing. The best way to compete is what? Don't, 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 don't compete. compete. Okay, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> rule number seven. Thank you. Our number one job is to look for buying signals. It's not leading the way. Uh, because here's what agents do. They go like this. Let's pretend I'm an agent and, uh, and, and a buyer's coming into the property. And this is the buyer. And I say, okay, come right this way. And I look in and I say, okay, here's the bathroom, dummy. And, and, the, and, the, and the buyer's thinking to themselves, you know, uh, I could tell it was the bathroom by that bowl on the floor and the shower. I kind of gave it away. But how many times have you been on a showing when the Cobra or the listing agent is saying, well, here's the bathroom. Uh, here's the living room. Yeah, I, when I saw the couch and the TV in the fireplace, I kind of figured that out. It was a living room. <laughs> you know, it's almost like you know, uh, here's here's the kitchen, dummy. Here's the bathroom, stupid. Um, here, this is a bedroom, you idiot. You know, it's kind of like that's what we're saying to the buyer. We're, we're leading them around the house, saying all these things about the property. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, for example, uh, you know, buying signals are how soon can we move into this property? Uh, sometimes they say, you know, uh, they'll knock the house, they'll, they'll complain about it. That's a buying signal. They wouldn't knock a property that they didn't care about. They just walk away and say, ah, this one isn't for us. You know, I've had people say, I, I don't like the color of those garage doors on that last house I saw, Sean. I don't like those color that garage doors in that house at all. They like that house. Otherwise, they wouldn't care about the color of the garage doors, folks. Right? <laughs> So I turn around and what would I say to him? No problem. No problem. What, what color, what color if, would you like? If, yeah. if, if, if you own the house, what color would you paint it? Right. Yeah. How much do you think that would cost? Oh, is that doable? Oh, okay. And then I just shut up and keep, you know, walking and kind of take it away. Um, you know, number eight, la uh, second to last. And we've had number seven, sometimes they blank and it's a buying signal. Oh, they knock a the property and it's a buying signal. Yeah, sometimes they uh, knock a property and it's a buying signal. Um, number eight, ignore objections. What are you talking about, John? Ignore objections. Yes. Some people say, boy, this room is small. Here's what I want you to do. Just ignore it. Because there is nothing you are ever going to say that is going to make that room bigger. They walk in, uh, Carol, and they say, boy, this house is a dump. And Carol goes, there's nothing Carol is going to say to make that room house cleaner. Right? Ignore it. That's another way of handling an objection. Um, so just whistle, right? Yeah, just whistle. <laughs> and by the way, if it is, here's, here's what else helps also. If you just go and you walk away. I mean, really ignore it. Here's what the low producing agent does. Well, what do you mean it's a small bedroom? Don't you think you and your wife, don't you think it's about time that you get bunk beds and you can share and put them against the wall and you can put it over here and they have them on sale, Bob's furniture, they're only $200 for a bunk bed. You get a, a matching nightstand and everything else, well, over here we can fit it right over here in the corner. I know it would block the window, but you don't, need, you don't need a window in the house anyway. Do you need that window in the bedroom? You could, unless it was a fire, you could open the window and jump up the window. Again. But we could do that. You could just move the bunk beds over to the side. That's what the average, average agent is doing. They're trying to sell the property. Listen, there's nothing you can do about it. Ignore it. Sometimes it'll just go away. Or they'll figure it out themselves. Or the, the wife will come up with an objection, and the husband will handle it. The husband will come up with an objection, and the wife will handle it. And then they go, oh, yeah, that's right. And they'll agree on it, right? Just like they always agree on everything, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no? But All right. Okay, great. But they're communicating. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now... Uh, yes, Sean. So is it best, like, when you're showing a house, they walk in to, uh, were you saying just to let them look around or lead them into a room or follow them into a room? Like the bedroom, you're going to see the master bedroom. Would you lead them to the master bedroom? I, would, I wouldn't be anywhere so near. Don't show them this is master bedroom. You want to maybe follow them to see their... I, if I'm going to follow them, I'm going to be far behind them. If they're upstairs, I want to be downstairs. Okay. If they're downstairs, I want to be upstairs. But I want to be, now follow this gang. Now follow this gang. I want to be within an earshot of them. I want to be able to hear them, but I don't want them to be able to see me. You follow me? 
because I want to listen for what? Buying signals, right? But I don't want them to see me. I want them to be comfortable. Almost like spying on them, if you will, right? In fact, hook a little uh, bug onto their lapel. You can hear everything they're saying in your ear, and you just sit in the car. That would be the best thing, yeah. all right? And then when, you, when they get back in the car, and you can say to them, so what did you think, right? That'd be great. They can tell you. They can sell you the house, right? Um, women are better salespeople than men all day long. Let's have a round of applause for women too. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, let's hear it. Hey, listen, I'm, this is something I'm saying. It's not in your handouts. Now, look, look at me for a second. Women are better salespeople than men. Let's have a round of applause for women salespeople. You ready? Right? John, what do you mean by that? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. <laughs> women do things that are different than men because uh, Men have these big egos in general, right? And what the man will do is uh, their ego gets in the way of them selling houses. Because let me give you an example like that. Um, how many houses that you sell in Massachusetts in this market area have basements? How many? Almost, almost all of them. And how many of those basements have little hairline cracks in them, even little small ones, right? Oh. And how many buyers find those cracks? All of them, right? Oh. <laughs> and, and what do they think? Oh, oh, a flood! You know, the buyer makes a big deal out of it. But here's what the male ego real, to real estate agent, salesperson says. Oh, that's no problem. You just dig down, tar up, fill up the hole, no big deal. Right? Mr. Fix-It. Yeah. But here's why women are, are better salespeople than men. And I say this with tremendous respect. You ready for this? Same buyer walks in, sees the crack. Oh my God, flooding whatsoever. You know, oh my God, this flood is going to come in. Here's what the smart woman salesperson says. She looks at the, uh, the buyers and says, oh, is it fixable? And the male ego customer says, oh yeah, no problem. You just dig it down, tower it up, fill up the crack, and fill up the hole. No problem, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's better to not have to deal with those objections, not handle them. Just ignore them, okay? So... Um, ignore what? Objections. Ignore objections. Next item, when you get signals, close for the what? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. <laughs> close for the sit down. Here's a rule of thumb. Always ask for a decision when they are sitting down. Always ask for a decision when they are sitting down. Here's a great closing question. You know, when you're closing for a listing, you say any questions, right? Here's, here's what you do for a buyer. Do you like the home? <coughs> yeah. yeah, let's go sit down. And here's what you do. You take your keys and you walk to the car. <laughs> you just go to the car. And here's what happens. They follow you and you drive to the office. And you walk up the stairs. Now, do you, you don't, have these people in the car with you? Yeah, okay. they're with you in the car. Okay. Okay. Let's go sit down. Maybe you, maybe you go sit down, you know, right okay. at the offer. Uh, here's the deal. When buyers go to buyer training school, they learn this technique called the, the parking <coughs> lot bailout technique. So you go to real estate training school. They go to buyer training school, and they learn this. Here's what they do. How many of you ever had a buyer that looks at their watch and says, oh, it's getting yeah. kind of late. we got to... I have to go home and iron my bowling shirt. Yeah, I gotta go, right? And you're like, oh, uh, oh okay, well, um, so what do you say? Well, there are three different things that I can share with you. How many, gang? Three. 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 Magic in threes. There it is again. Um, they say, look at the time. We have to go home. And you say what? No problem. No problem. No problem. Let's go in for a couple of minutes and let me give you some answers to your questions. And then you can take off. And that works most of the time. See, a pro gets them to do what? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down, right? Sometimes they'll say, well, sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, we need to think about it. And so then you say, in other words, you like the home enough to think about it, right? Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we go in for a couple of minutes? I'll prepare everything as if you did. Decide yes, as if you did. This is called the as if you did closing technique. You can take all that information with you and you can make a decision while having all the facts.
So what I do is I write up the whole offer. I'm going to give you the paperwork. I'm not going to present it or take it or anything. You don't have to write me a check. And I want you to go home and you put this offer under your pillow and sleep on it. And wake up the next morning and see how you feel. And if you feel like you still want the house after you've written up the offer, then drop the offer off at my office. If you wake up the next morning and you feel like, geez, you know, that was a mistake, tear it up and throw it away. That's all. How's that sound? Because that's the best way, as if you did, that's the, probably the best way to know how you're going to feel about it. Let's go. And then I wa start walking into the office and they start following me. Sometimes that does, a pro gets them to do what, gang? What? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. Sometimes that doesn't work. And they say, well, we're not really sure. And here's the last technique, and it's the most powerful one. I love this. If I could get you this house today for uh, blank less, say $10,000, $5,000, give me a number. $5,000. All right, great. Today, and I'm not saying I could, but if I could, would you buy it today? And they go, well, yeah, I would. Oh, great, let's go sit down. And I write up the offer, and I take that off the asking price, and I put it in the offer form, and I write up the offer. I submit it, we negotiate, they buy the house. Right, gang? It gets them moving in the right direction. A pro gets them to do what? Sit down. Sit down. Rule number 10, ask them to buy every house. Was this a fun-filled... Action-packed workshop or Action what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited about the next session that's coming up. It's um, preparing to present the offer. Huge. Uh, you know, talk about uh, winning and losing races in the last quarter of the race. Uh, you, you've got to the point where you actually wrote up the offer now. Remember I showed you how to get the appointment with the buyer. I showed you how to get the buyer to work with you exclusively and how to pick out uh, only three to five homes, right? And I showed you how to get the buyer back into the office, and now it's time to write up the offer. But you have to prepare to present that offer. And if you're not presenting it to the seller, you at least have to present it to the Cobro. And I am a huge fan of presenting it directly to the seller if you can. But uh, I, I, I like what I wrote here. It says, most races are won or lost in the last quarter mile. Similarly, most real estate commissions are won or lost when it comes to preparing to present the offer. You're going to like this session because on this day you will learn how to get an offer accepted versus postponed or counted. And when an offer is postponed or counted, that is, in Massachusetts law, that is a rejection of the offer. So too many of us are writing up offers and the offers are getting rejected instead of getting accepted. I'm going to show you how to do that. The only way to learn, and how many keys are there? Six. Which is two times what? Three. All right, two times three is six. Uh, to getting an offer accepted is to show up. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you Floyd Wickman's, uh, what he calls his best offer for first, four-step track. And that kind of speaks for itself. If you can get the best offer first up front, your odds are, dr are drastically increased of getting that offer accepted. If you can get the best offer out of the buyer first, I'm going to share with you um, some techniques on how to get that uh, offer done. So that's next Friday at 10 a.m. Please don't miss it. You've been a phenomenal audience. Give yourselves a hand. Yay. Thank you so much. Let's go sell some houses, right? Yeah. Or they're going to sell themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah, bring the value tomorrow, and I already printed out these things. I got to leave it. It's going to be hard. Yeah. It's like, I was really going to give them these. I know. But try it. Good. That's what I always tell people to try it. The, the new people, they don't have a problem with. They're like, okay, they just do it. Yeah. But, you know, if you're used to doing it so. Yeah, it's showing like, them so much. Like sure. 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 Yep. Excuse me, I'm just going to shut the camera.